Hello and welcome to Hearth Singer Tales, everybody. I am your dungeon master and your host, Anne Richmond, aka Hearth Singer, the head bard in charge round these parts. And I am, in fact, the luckiest dungeon master in the entire world because I am joined by some incredible friends who I am very excited to play with. Sup? Hi. Hi. Hello. There they are, everybody. Listen to them. <laughs> First, I want to go around and let everybody introduce themselves. So let's start with Diana. Uh, yeah, I am Diana D'Amico. I do a lot of storytelling over on the Renegade Games channel in the World of Darkness and one half of Bard and Barbarian. So you can usually find me doing something nerdy 24 hours a day. Um, tonight... I will be playing my very favorite D&D character, Daria Volcanis, uh, the Tiefling Blood Hunter. And pronouns? She, her, for both of us. And Chris Gideon, welcome to the show. Oh my god, it's a me. Hello. <laughs> I'm Chris. I use she, they pronouns. You can find me on Twitter at Kiss of Hemlock. I'm kind of all over the place, primarily over uh, at the Free Forge, kind of my home community. Um where I'm also on the actual play uh, Stay Alive, which is on Wednesdays, and then also on the Fayforge Academy, which is another uh, 5e podcast about a magical school. It's far less problematic than the one you're probably thinking of, so you should listen to us instead of consuming that other trash, turfy media. I'm playing Endo, uh, she, her pronouns, and Aladrin Cleric. Hi, I'm Chris with a C, that's how you can tell me apart. Uh, more commonly known as the Painting Pirate, mini painter slash variety streamer, if by variety you mean mostly Final Fantasy stuff. A uh, player on a whole bunch of variety of charity based one shots, as well as a regular on Brinkwood, Blood of Tyrants. And my pronouns are he, him. I forgot if I didn't say it already. If not, I'll say it twice because we'll just keep hammering that into everyone's heads until it becomes standard. And I am playing Brock, the shifter barbarian, who also uses he, him pronouns. And, and if you don't know me and you've happened to find this fine piece of media content on the internet somehow without knowing who I am, uh, my name is Anne Richmond, which I've already said, uh, but, but it bears repeating, I guess. You're still Anne Richmond. I'm still it's, her. It's important to know. It's, it really is uh, for me, mostly. <laughs> what if I forget who I am? Uh, which can happen to Dungeon Masters. Uh, but I do YouTube content about all sorts of tabletop role-playing games. You name it, I love to play it pretty much. And this is a show that I have created to start telling stories online with my friends in different uh, different systems. And we're gonna start with a classic. We're gonna start with ye olde Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. How does everybody feel about D&D 5e? Good, this is like my gateway drug to teach Gateway drug, so. yeah. I, I literally don't know anything about the others, so first is the best, which means 5e is the best, right? And <laughs> Nobody at us. <laughs> Honestly, I only played a bit of 4E. Most of my D&D experiences with 5E, um, and that's fine. Uh, don't at me, I guess. <laughs> what about you, Chris? I've bounced around a whole bunch of systems, played a bunch of 4E, Pathfinder, like yeah. Game of Fantasy back in the day. Uh, I'm a big fan of 5E. I The other systems are great, especially if you're big into like super crunchy, heavy numbers. I'm not big into the super heavy, crunchy numbers these days. I like to keep things simple and do the fun storytelling stuff, and I find yeah. it really helps facilitate that. So I'm very, very, very fond of it. Now, have any of you played in the Feywild before? Oh, yes. I, no, it is entirely new to me. First foray. But what's beautiful is, like, everybody's Feywild is a little bit different. So you never play in the same Feywild twice if you play for two different GMs. So this is going to be really, really good. My Feywild is actually just, like, an old abandoned Kmart parking lot. <laughs> That's but as you close can as we find can a lot of life. magic there. <laughs> we eat everything. <laughs> Um, no, sign no, all contracts no, without no, reading that's them. Tell everybody your full name every time you interact oh, yeah. with them. And you know, the th we love the theater. If ever, if you get a chance to go visit the theater, absolutely <laughs> take that. So this is the yeah. first and last episode of this show, is what <laughs> yeah. I'm hearing. What is something that excites you about playing in the Feywild, and what is something that terrifies you? 
I'm a big fan of consequences. Don't you just love a good consequence? I do, especially with characters who are so, like, cocksure and confident, which is exactly what Daria is. That moment where they're sort of taken down a peg by something that is truly more powerful than they are by leaps and bounds, and they kind of have that realization of, oh, I'm not the shit. Um, I love that. Amazing. How about you, Chris? Which, Which one? Chris? Chris Gideon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm looking to, I'm looking forward to some like fake court shenanigans. I'm kind of, mm. you know, there's always some fun and like the political and social intrigue in a fae setting, fae wild setting. Um, what am I terrified of? Also the social and political interactions that we might experience <laughs> in the fae wild. Amazing. And painting pirate, how about you? So I am a huge fan of like the old school fairy tales, like the really dark ones, the the, the consequences, the wordplay, the trickery. I'm really looking forward to all that type of stuff coming into play. What I am most terrified of is that type of stuff coming into play with a DM <laughs> who has said to me numerous times over the course of our friendship, if you're not crying, are you really playing D&D? <laughs> if it's not PTSD and D, were you even playing? tale begins in the summer wilds. Moss, rough stone, impossibly tall trees, lush grass filled with blooming flowers in vibrant colors that sway gently in a friendly breeze. Presently, it is the darkest point of twilight when the shadows are at their longest, the closest thing to night that the Feywild has to offer. Strange creatures hoot and chirp and sing their rhythmic vesper to the centerpiece of this mystic grove, a gargantuan tree of glowing green crystal. Even the light here seems to breathe. The wind blows through this grove and the glass leaves ripple and ring out like comforting chimes, scattering motes of magical light. And beneath this tree is a solitary hooded figure holding an axe carved with pulsing red runes. With a roll of thunder and a flash of steel, our vision comes to the present. One week later, all of you find yourselves standing before what is now a desecrated crystalline tree, now dull and clouded with a crack that splinters the entire surface from roots all the way out to the ends of the branches. Broken glass leaves lay shattered and scattered across the dry, cracked earth at the base of the tree, and standing before it, the bereft Arkfey Queen of the Summer Court and her Harringen guard stare at the three of you. I'd love for each of you to describe your characters. Starting with Daria. Daria stands just under, I think, probably six foot nine. Not six foot nine, five foot nine. Not that tall, guys. Not that tall. She's got lavender-toned skin, sort of a, a wild ponytail of plum-colored hair to uh, elongated red horns meeting in sort of a U-shape above her head. She wears a red tailcoat 
uh, embellished with some gold cord work. It's very fine, very um, elegant in nature. Red leather pants, uh, sort of equestrian boots. They're very, very shiny. They don't look very well worn from months at a time on the road. Daria has uh, a rapier at her side and leather fingerless gloves that she's kind of got her hands resting on her hips as she stands there, a, a half smile on her face. How about Endo? So Endo is just a few inches shorter than Daria. Probably arms crossed very lazily across her chest. She has deep brown skin that kind of has a strange, almost iridescent quality to it where it sort of flashes pinks and purples like a sunset from you just catch it in the right light she has long dark uh like jet black wavy hair that's about waist length that seems like it has little white flecks uh like little twinkles again you just have to catch it in the right light like starlight pale white gold starlight eyes um and she is dressed in very casual kind of like draped linen and gossamer and silk kind of revealing but it is covered by a cloak that goes to about the calf uh, this dark kind of charcoal gray uh, thick material and she has very pale gold chains and things braided through her hair lots of jewelry um, and she is not currently holding anything uh, in her hand but has a, but it does have a hand kind of very casually drifting toward the pack that she's wearing on her hip. And Brock? Brock stands a shade over six foot, about six two, six three. although despite being taller than the other two, almost seems off as he is visibly smaller as he is trying desperately not to attract any attention to himself, uh, standing a bit further back. Larger, wider, somewhat stocky build, he appears to be in about his mid-fifties. Human, but something slightly off about his appearance. His ears are slightly too elongated. His eyebrows are slightly too bushy. His build wider and more muscular than an average human's would be. Kind of ruddy skin, the type who looks as if he's spent a great deal of time working outside. Has a mutton chop beard with a mustache. You can see under his flat cap he is visibly balding but still within his beard has salt and pepper hair coloration which has started to grow into black and white streaks throughout the beard nose is elongated somewhat narrow with a small pair of spectacles perched upon the end uh, his clothing is in a word functional uh, dressed in very neutral earthy tones wearing a long gardening coat over a uh, sturdy looking but well used shirt and set of trousers well worn comfortable looking work boots uh, the one piece of embellishment he has is a leaf green neckerchief which is decorated with paw print patternings tied around his neck slung over his back is a large double-handed woodsman's axe and standing a bit further back from the other two he is awkwardly just toying with his neckerchief and looking down at the ground. The Arcfey Queen's golden hair is sort of falling about her face, which is lined with deep concern. Only three of the five courts sent representatives. It doesn't seem right. And the broad-shouldered Harringen captain squints down at you all appraisingly. And me, your highness, don't forget about me. I could never, she says. I wish to know you all. Come, friends. Tell me your names. Your Highness, uh, Daria will step forward and make a sweeping bow, arms out at either side. Daria Volcanus, at your service. And if I might be so bold, I've been told I'm worth what five men can give. So don't be discouraged. Do you feel that you're worth what five men can give, Daria? Oh, or 100%. is this persuasion or deception? Make a case either way. You know, uh, I think this is probably more performance than anything else. Okay, um, we'll, we'll uh, chalk it up to bravado. Go ahead and roll a performance roll for me. I should have just let it be persuasion because <laughs> that's a way better modifier. Okay, but that's not terrible. 16. Oh, yeah. Um, you see as... 
the first sign of uh, joy re returns to this woman's very concerned face and she laughs and throws her head back and then locks you in a very strong gaze and her piercing sort of silvery eyes find yours and she says I'll just bet you are Daria Vulcanus of the court of hunger was it Yes, um, as I said, completely at your beck and call, your majesty. And why were you hungry for this mission? Anyone could have come, and she looks at, at each of you having come from each of your courts. I, of course, wanted to be of service. It is this humble servant's greatest pleasure to give her life in service of the summer court. There's no nobler cause. Oh, Daria, now, now, we all know that those who serve the will of the court of hunger thirst for a personal gain of some kind. There must be some reason that you wish to throw down your life so willingly. I do love a woman who's as smart as she is beautiful. Your Highness, you are correct. Of course, there's something else that I'm after, but truly I just wish to be noticed by those who hold sway in the hopes that I might learn from their leadership and goodwill. That's a lie. Hundreds. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead and, and roll a deception Amazing. check. <laughs> Please be good. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> that's, that's ten. She sort of narrows her eyes and looks, tilts her chin up. So she's really regarding you from, you know, higher up on this mound of earth that she's standing on. And she says, Daria, you're always welcome to come back and live with your family here. Should you change your mind about what you're after in your new digs so far afield? What expression is the, the Harrington guard wearing while the queen? Oh, insight check. Through. Oh, boy. Dirty 20. Okay, that's good. Odir is looking at this connection, this sort of repartee between the two of you with interest and maybe even a little jealousy. Daria won't respond directly to her majesty, but will sort of turn to go and stand behind the rest of the group so that they can mm -hmm. introduce themselves. And in doing so, she's just going to just going to throw the guard a wink. Um, mm -hmm. Just really twist that knife a little bit. Yeah, you notice the the whiskers just rustle a, a little bit with frustration and maybe a tiny bit of disgust at your callous nature. Good. Good. Rustle them whiskers. As this exchange is happening. Whatever that is happening. Whatever is happening over here. Uh, I Endo is definitely giving a long up and down look to this individual. Um not necessarily suspicious, but just like, you know, you size up when there's like one hot girl that sees another hot girl. You got to like, I got to see what your deal is. Are you a competition? Are you a threat? Can we be allies and conquer together? That kind of a thing. Um, but as this exchange starts to kind of peter out awkwardly, Endo will just say, uh, excuse me. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Endo. I don't. I assume you know who I am. From the gloaming, yes? Well, we're loosely associated. Um, they, the Vespa kind of leaves us alone. We do what we want to do. They do what they want to do. It's kind of live and let live. But yes, technically, sort of. <sighs> Far be it from me to wonder if the gloaming is too busy with their own frolicsome ways to try to save the world. But I suppose 
I am grateful that you have chosen to join us here and try to understand what has befallen this cataclysm. I'll glance over at Brock. If he's still looking down, just kind of like elbow him. Kind of hard. He very much is still looking down. Just gonna go, oh, 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 oh dear. Um, and he just takes an awkward kind of half step, but then just drops to, to one knee, still very much not looking up at the Arkfey. My, my name is Brock, your majesty, your highness. Uh, I were sent by the Carter Seeds. Yes, the Ark Druid Kyanite Carborundum is a close personal friend of our court, and I can tell from your dress that you are not native to our realm in the Feywild. I, I am no I am I am not, your majesty. I am an outsider and the Ark Druid was very kind to me and was willing to allow me to take up a place as a vassal of the court in exchange for my services. Interesting. And are you not afraid to travel here, where so many of your kind have been led up and down, up and down, and astray from their walks of life? If I might be so bold, Your Majesty, uh, in my experience... Folk out in the mortal world are just as untrustworthy and tricksy. <laughs> I find the dealings here in the Feywild to be a bit more palatable. Well, sometimes it takes a bit of getting lost to find exactly what you're looking for, Brock, doesn't it? It's v- very wisely spoken, Your Highness. What do you think could have done such a thing? All of you have experiences in your various parts of the realm, but have you ever seen something so horrible happen to one of our sacred places? And she is again referring to this tree with the great crack across its surface, no longer glowing. Now, Daria, you would have seen this tree in your in your childhood, uh, in its full radiant splendor. Uh, this is not. This is no longer the case as it once was. Do we know what could have possibly done this? Well, uh, I would take a history or an arcana or an investigation Oof. check. Oof. Oof. Oh. oh, advantage <laughs> on history checks. I think I'll... Uh... Would you take a nature check? I would, I would take a nature check. I can, I can make that work for you, Brock. 16. 16. And this is for history? Yes. Every court, while it has its differences, agrees that the groves must be protected. They must be maintained. Now, some scholars from the Court of Influence have surmised that the tree's root systems are all connected between the courts. Even though each grove takes on a different appearance, they're all sort of connected by these ley lines. And the groves themselves are like arcane lodestones. They attract magic to a single place and tether it down so that it can be shot out and spread across the entire plane like a veil of life itself. If that magic were released, it could potentially destabilize magic in general around the Feywild and start slingshotting arcane energy anywhere else. And it is incredibly rare for these types of summons to be sent out across the Feywild, demanding that a member of each court come to the aid of one of the leaders. This is probably the first time in a thousand generations. And so it is odd that of all of you standing here, there is a representative missing from the Court of Influence. Brock, did you want to roll a nature check? It was a nat 20. Oh, baby. For a 22. Ooh, hey. 
get those good rules done out the gate. That's not gonna keep <laughs> it's good. I mean, listen, you might as well start with the uh, the information. And just so I know, Endo, what kind of check were you hoping to roll? <laughs> I don't have any skills that apply here, but I'm just I'm really pretty to look at, so I'm just going just to just really here. happy to be here. Yeah, okay, it's fine. excellent. All right, so Brock, nature and magic are linked so intrinsically here. This area has changed a lot. You have your own grove back at the Court of Seeds, and to see this dry, cracked ground, to see that the the crystal here is dull, that the leaves are shattering and falling from the branches, this, this change uh, and desecration has happened at incredible speed, and it's sort of stretching its way out from the central point of the tree. The magic has been drawn away from this place. The tether has been cut here, and now this magic is being thrown somewhere. Now, where is the key? But what you do realize as you trace your fingers over the rotting away roots, you notice that there's sort of a braided coil of several roots drawing away into the forest beyond that is particularly blackened and is growing with these different uh, mushrooms that are not native to this plane, as far as you know. Whatever, whoever did this, they took the magic, I reckon. It looks like it's leading over toward the forest over there. So either they went off that way, or whoever wanted them to come and do this as something to lure the magic over in that direction. I think it's very clear what's happened here. Captain Odier gives a chuff at the mere thought that you might be able to explain so easily what's been perplexing them. Well, why don't you speak up then? All right, I mean... Your Majesty, I'm so sorry to tell you that you're guards couldn't pick up on this, but it's very clearly the work of the Court of Influence that's going on here. Who else would so boldly strike out at you and then not send a dignitary? It is true. The court of influence sent no Alcan magisters to heed our call. Could this be so? And oh dear says, now hold on just a tick. I, I feel that you are making a big assumption. They they're very busy over at that library uh, doing whatever it is they do with their, their, their books. and Your their, you Highness, know. who else would benefit from such an imbalance in the way that our magic is handled? All right, you want to do this? Now, there's only one other person who's looking for magic like this. Someone from the Court of Hunger would know that her majesty's sister is trying to reconstitute herself. She was pulled into a billion bajillion pieces at one point, and who knows what what it would take, what kind of magical energy it would take to restore her, but the hags at the Court of Hunger might have an interest in this kind of magical release. Not in a sexual way. My queen isn't stupid enough to gun straight for the summer court without first eliminating other obstacles in her path. That would be a foolhardy and foolish move. But wouldn't it make sense to to distract us by actually sending someone from the court to cast dispersions on somebody else who couldn't come? Oh no, I assure you, my dispersions are all my own. I certainly hope you're not the main military strategist for the Summer Court, or you all are in dire straits. I can't work like this. <laughs> and the Queen says, Peace, Captain Odia, peace. You must calm yourself. And the ears that are straight up and twitching sort of like fall back uh, across Odia's neck. I'm only trying to help. Odia gives a grunt of discontent and moves towards the edge of the grove to watch from a distance. I'm sure that you are. Captain Odier is 
worked up. You see, she cares greatly about what has happened, and this is our home. And we must find where this magic has been thrown off to. It cannot simply dissolve. Perhaps you could follow the magic off uh, along this way that Brock has seemed to find, or you could visit another court. What makes sense to you? I mean, we're already here. It seems like a lot of work to not... I mean, we don't want to double back. I would say we at least look and see what we find around here before we move on. One thing I might note here as well is there's these right interesting mushrooms what I have been busy in myself over here with. Uh, they are, they're a bit strange in that I don't think I've ever seen anything like this in the Feywild. They're not from here. I don't know whether that means that they were pulled in here from some other plane of reality, or if whatever did this left them behind somehow. But there's something very, very strange going on. And again, I apologise if I'm speaking out of place, but I do believe that it is perhaps our most expedient course of action to go and investigate the direction what this might be although of course I could be entirely wrong in which case I will be quiet that was a lot and some of it was very wise and some of it was very sweet now, if this is your choice, then, well, I suppose I must do my best to ground the magic here, to do what it is I was made to do. I must give of my own life force to invigor this land for a time. And Daria, Brock, Endo, you must solve this mystery before I fade. For I cannot tether our magic forever, and when my light has gone, there may be no way to balance this grove again. Please, take this. And she extends this long, lithe limb, and from her fingertips grows a ring of sort of druid craft that forms itself into ironwood. And she reaches up into her flower crown and pulls a single glowing seed with a bit of a gasp as if this is definitely not just something that would drop off of her, but is a part of her. It means something to her existence. And she places it in the setting of this ironwood ring of protection and holds it out to the group. As the seed pulses with light, shedding dim light in about like a five foot radius around it. She says, when this seed loses its light, I will have been gone. That will tell you how much time you have. Who will take this ring? I mean, I guess I'll take it. Uh, I'll just kind of warily reach out. She extends her hand uh, and gently places it on your finger. She steps back towards the tree and her toes begin to extend, becoming roots that drive themselves into the ground. Her arms reach out from her chest, giving herself over to this magical transformation as her fingers become vines and wrap themselves around the tree behind her like some natural... Uh, figurehead on a ship sort of wrapping itself guiding herself around the trunk of this tree and soon enough she has become a part of it her skin hard and bark like and there is a thrum 
that sort of pulses out from the tree and from the ground you feel sort of moisture return to the soil. You see tiny sprouts begin to poke their heads up out of this ground again. You see that green verdant energy begin to push and pulse itself through the tree, always trying to resurrect itself to full strength, but always seeping out of that crack. This is a temporary solution. And its power and its majesty is beautiful, but it is very clear that time is of the essence and what happens next is going to be up to the three of you. everybody thank you so much for tuning in to the very first episode of heart singer tales if you are enjoying the episode please subscribe come back for more and of course leave us an itunes review this really helps us to get discovered by more people so please do it and this podcast was made possible by the heart singer games patreon so thank you to all of those folks who brought this story to life this was my dream you made it a reality and just thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, if you're interested in joining the Patreon, you should know that your subscription there grants you early access to episodes, gives you the ability to sign up for games run by me when available, and uh, it also grants you special behind the scenes content like art or interviews with the cast, all while making this production possible. You can follow me, your dungeon master, uh, at Anne Richmond on Twitter uh, for all things Hearthsinger Tales in the future. And you can check out the episode description for links to how to follow and support our cast and crew. Please go show them some love. They deserve it. They worked really hard to bring this to you. Now, let's get back to our adventure. Is the Harrington still nearby? I hate to say it, but yes. Captain Odier is watching this, and you see as the captain takes a knee, having seen this, and you can um, roll an insight check. Oh, boy. Um, that's a 10. You just see the sort of stoic, knight-like quality of this Harrington kneeling uh, with her head down on the uh, butt of her axe. So should we talk to you about payment then? Oh, Jiminy Christmas. She turns around and sort of takes in all of you and she says, well, I guess the finer print is going to depend on what we work out here, so I guess this is a sacred quest called upon all the courts. Uh, you all showed up, and uh, we would obviously be happy to, you know, pay you, I suppose, something if you're not just willing to, you know, save all our gosh darn lives with the goodness of your hearts. What is it you want, Daria, if that is your real name? Yes, that's my real name. Why would I go by anything else? <laughs> Seems far less impactful. I mean, e Endo, Brock, surely there are things that you two desire. All I really would like is a favor from the fa or from the summer court to be rendered at a time of my choosing. A favor? A simple favor. The queen here has, has put herself into whatever the hell, hibbity-jibbity, this kind of nature magic. Honestly, it's not my thing. I swing at things and they die. That is what I do. I don't know a lot about all this natural stuff. If you don't do this, you know, the whole world could end. So it's a very valuable service and a, fo a favor seems like a small price to pay for the entire world. You're saving yourself, Daria. How are you going to get out of this if you fail? Oh, I can always find a way out. You know that arguing is going to put wrinkles on your face. This is not, I would not. 
Maybe, how about when the queen is awakened after we are successful with our quest, when we come back, uh, we could just have an audience and perhaps plead our individual cases to her directly. I guess we gotta give you something. Uh, well, I mean, if if and you're willing to make a deal, I suppose we could give you one collective group favor. One apiece is, I think, fairly reasonable. Standard. Going rate, actually. <laughs> All right. Uh, roll a persuasion check. I can't believe you're making me roll for this. How can I help? Because this is my bread and butter. You you can choose one of you to roll with advantage since you both participated in charming the pants off of a mad rabbit. <laughs> mad rabbit. Uh, you can roll with advantage if you want. Okay. Boy, am I glad I had advantage. That's a 23. All right. So Captain Odier draws herself up to her full height again and reaches uh, for a cup that is hanging from her belt. She reaches out and plucks a piece of fruit that is now growing from one of the queen's outstretched fingertips and cuts it with a knife and begins squeezing the juice of it into the cup. Well, if you're willing, I would say upon completion of this great task... The restoration of our grove, should every grove be intact by the time you are done and our queen restored to life, then we would owe you each a single favor. Will you drink? Uh, Just a quick clarifying question. Um... What about the cult of influence? Are we required to help them? They didn't even show up today. This is all really their fault, so I don't really <laughs> think they should count when we're talking about saving courts. Everyone knows librarians aren't people. It's oh fine. God. Um no. <laughs> <laughs> Odier grins at you and she says, Are you willing to take that risk? There could be a very good reason that they're not here. Maybe they were attacked. Maybe something happened to them. You should probably stick to the whole swinging at things and them dying rather than the speculation. Leave that to the experts. We'll take care of it. Don't you worry. Well, perhaps I'll go see what happened at the Court of Influence and y'all can follow this root or whatever it is the, the mushroom thing Ugh. never liked him not even sauteed so are are we doing are we good <laughs> are, we, are we doing this we doing yeah. this so uh <laughs> she holds out the the um chalice but what happens if we drink this and not every tree is secured what happens then? Uh, then uh, you don't get the, 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 the thing. Now, if you wanted to create sort of a subclause where if, you know, one of those things happens, then you get one. Or we could make it so that, let's say, you figure out what's going on, but you don't manage to save the world and it's all just bedlam and every fay for themselves. Can I just kind of slink up? And put a a hand gently on her wrist and take the cup out of her hand and take a sip while she's talking. That's bonding, she says. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't, that's too much thinking. We'll just say we'll get it done. I'm, I'm going to put my hand on Endo's shoulder and just say, we might be making the contract with the guard, but the queen will make sure that we get what's due to us when we're done here. Um, And I'm going to hold out my hand for the cup. I will give it over. Yeah. Uh, And before I drink from it, I'm going to walk over to Brock and kind of put it in front of him. Oh, oh dear. Uh, I don't really 
follow, but if this is what you think is best, Mistress Volcanus, then I will follow your, your guidance on this. And he will take a, a sip. Um, I'll take the cup from Brock. Obviously pleased at the name Mistress Volcanus. I'm all about that. <laughs> um, and I'll walk back over in in front of uh, the the guard and just kind of without breaking eye contact, drink almost all of the the fruit juice that's left and hand them the cup with the last little sip in it. But I want to kind of use the cuff of my jacket to wipe where I drink as I hand it over. Go ahead and roll an insight check. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not in the habit of just leaving my fluids all over the Feywild. Um, insight? There's a life lesson in that. Yeah, yeah I know, right? <laughs> That's an 11. They're hard to read as Odir takes the chalice from you, uh, but she locks eyes with you as she drinks down the last bit. As she does, the chalice crumbles into just the nicest, most fertile uh, dirt that you've ever seen. And it falls to the ground and begins to grow a small sprout out of it. She says, well, then I guess all four of us should be on our way. What? You're coming with us? This is wonderful news. Oh, no. You're all going your way. I'm going to the court of influence. Oh, thank God. But I've got my eye on you. Just remember that. Captain Odir sees everything. That seems impossible. You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? And she just (laughs) turns and starts hopping away uh, into the forest. There's something so appealing about getting under her skin. It is fun, but she's not so she's not so bad. Um maybe we could, I don't know, warm her up a little bit, butter her up, is that what you say? Put butter on them. Uh, that's a very different action, but I do like what you're thinking. <laughs> Brock, what do you think? Brock is very very intently examining his boots right now. Darling, why don't you raise your raise your chin? Look, oh, look directly oh, oh, at it's sorry. Oh, the view's much better up here, I assure you. <laughs> oh dear. Uh I as as you say, Mistress Volcanus, as you say. Should should I call you Sire Brock uh, oh, or pl- just no, uh, uh, Mr. Brock? Please just just Brock. Brock uh, Esquire. I, or Brock or or you is what I am mostly familiar with but Brock is perfectly fine Brock then oh, yes and for for you as well of, of course mistress uh, mistress Lunator. oh you don't that's <laughs> uh not really a mistress more of a sub personally but uh anyway what should we should we go ahead and get started? I don't really. I don't. It's kind of what's well, standing here. I'm kind of bored of it. Absolutely. One episode is all it took. <laughs> Look, my first line was For a double entendre. Know. We've all gone to this sub dom thing. Like you knew. I know. It's like come to Heartsinger Tales. They I said. I specifically asked you if I could make the thirstiest fucking character. I know. In the it's universe. true. I you just, said you just, do it. And I said do it. You won't. But then, <laughs> by gum and by Reader, gum, I you did. really did it. <laughs> yeah, you really did it. All three of you getting to know each other a little bit better, I would say, uh, as this adventure begins. You begin trailing your footsteps along this mushroom begotten root as it follows the path of desecration deep into the heart of the Feywild. Mm-hmm.